Mr. Charles Paul and Mr. Corey Crowder. How are you doing, sirs? Doing Good. Well. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I want to thank you for taking the time out to come on the rematch on basketballnews.com and Fly TV. Um, you know, your son is Chris Paul. Your son is Jay Crowder. You know, Phoenix is doing great. You know, and with, with it being close to Father's Day, I really wanted to, to you know, I'm glad you all took to the, you know, took the time out to come on the show today because I want to really put the, the importance and shine a light on the importance of fathers. And, you know, it's something that's not talked about enough. I was just telling uh, Mr. Paul before we started that, you know, honestly, I don't know why the NBA doesn't do more of this. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. I don't know why, because I'm watching the game and they're panning through the crowd. And I'm seeing like it was like six different fathers, you know, all on Phoenix and all in the crowd and all cheering and all everything like that. I was like, that's a story. Why don't we highlight that? Let me let me ask you before we even get started. Why don't you think we see more stories about this in particular? Let me start with you, Mr. Paul. Man, I can't tell you. Like I said, I've been been a part of the Fathers and Men's organization for ten years, and uh, that's a that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it, and not me. All right, I can ask. It's so important. Like when I meet fathers like uh, Corey and uh, all the other fathers, I meet um, Payne, Tony Payne, and all them guys. Man, whenever I go to teams, I try to interact and get the fathers that I know. But, uh, man, like you say, all us at the game supporting our kids like we've always done since they was little. And that hasn't stopped. But yet and still, the NBA wants to highlight the ones that didn't have a father. Right. Right. What, what do you think, Mr. Corey? Why do you think we don't hear more about 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 all the fathers and the great things that you're doing and the roles that y'all have played throughout their entire their entire lives? Like, why don't we hear more stories like that? I mean, I, I mean, it, I, I don't know. And, and it goes back to when I see guys get on TV and they receive some award, they always think mama. First. You know, that's the first thing that comes first. They always, Yeah, first. They always think mama. And that, that's okay with us. That's right. fine. Um, right. What we do, when you do see fathers there, we're not there for the glory. We're there because we're there supporting our kids. And I feel bad for the fathers that are not there. Mm. So I don't think it's the NBA's I would love for them to highlight it. I do what I do for the love of my son. I don't do it. If the NBA highlight it, they don't. It don't even matter. We Say would it like again, that Corey. publicity. We would love that publicity so it can put fathers in a in a different light so they don't think that we just come around whenever the kid make money or they're doing something good. Whether right. they're good or bad, I can see me and Mr. Paul and these other fathers on this Phoenix team, we're there to support these guys. Right, right. You know, I, I wrote a um, fatherhood book a few years ago, and I actually interviewed Chris Paul for the book. And I, um, one of the things that he said, he said that um, he, he was talking about his son, and he said his name is Christopher Emmanuel Paul II. He said, growing up, I was fortunate enough to have a mom and dad always there for me in everything I've done. He said, but playing in the NBA is kind of a given that I will miss some things. Um, and I feel fortunate that I was there for his birth but I really found the importance of being there from my father. Mm. Um, how, how does that, how does that, that make mm -hmm. you feel to hear? Cause this, this, that's the first thing he said. So yeah. we're in, I'm interviewing him for this book. That's the, that was the first two or three lines. How does it feel to hear your son, Chris talk about you that way? I mean, it just, I, I just thank God that, that he gets it. You know, that's the main thing because like most parents today, they, they train their kids to be, my son's going to the NBA, my son is going to the NBA, uh, NFL. That ain't how I raise my boys. I raise them to be good people and to love what they do. I played streetball basketball. I didn't go to college, I didn't do none of that, but I wanted my kids to get an education. It all started by the education. Uh, I didn't foresee neither of my sons going in the NBA, but I knew they played well enough to go to college. Uh -huh. So that was me and his mama's thing, but it wasn't never like, I know my son going to the NBA. I'm, I'm, I'm grooming him to be an NBA player. Now I was grooming him to be a great, a great, uh, person and then uh, a great son. And then, you know, that transported into being a great father, but Man, we talk to these parents so much today, man, and they 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 missing the big picture about still being a parent, not wanting to be on TV, not wanting to be seen 
like Corey said, that ain't that ain't what that ain't what we've done all our lives. We have been there for a purpose, and that's to raise our young men to grow up to be young men and young fathers first. Uh, Mr. Crowder, let me ask you as well, you know, talk about, you know, young with, with Jay and how your relationship was and what you instilled into him at a young age. Well, I never would push my kids, including Jay, into sports. <laughs> I don't, people ask me all the time. I got four other kids. They ask me, do they play sports? My kids don't have to play sports because I play. Oh. Now, when Jay decided to go down that road, uh, I told him, and I never pushed him to do it, mm -hmm. but I said, if this is what you want to do, I'll help you make your way to do that. Mm -hmm. But in doing that, and God is my witness, and I'm so happy that, that God gave me the enlightenment to be able to understand, he needs me to be dad first. Mm -hmm. He don't need me to be basketball, Corey. He wants dad. Mm -hmm. I don't talk basketball to this kid unless he says basketball something to me. Okay. So I have to watch the games before him because I'm kind of doing my scouting. So mm -hmm. whenever he has a problem, I need to be able to give him relevant information to get him back on track. Right. What, uh, there, was a, there was a couple of games in the uh, L.A. series. He started out bad. I was at his house. I came in right before he walked out the door to go to the game. I just said this to him. I said, just be great. Just be do something on both ends of the court to make mm -hmm. sure that, that you're present. I don't care about the points and the rebounds. Man. Just to let them know that you're there, you're present in the game on offense mm -hmm. or defense. I shut up and let him go play his game. That's right. That's great. That's great. Right. And, and Mr. Paul, I was reading um, about some of the sacrifices that you made when, when, when Chris was young. Um, you actually had to dip into your 401k a little bit in order to pay for AAU dues. And I know, you know, I'm in the AAU world now and I, you know, I coach my son's <laughs> AAU team. And I know that some of those dues, you know, we're a church team, so we keep our dues a little low. But I know some of these other programs, those dues get a little expensive. But talk about that sacrifice that you that you had to make uh, really to for him to be able to play AAU. Man, it's it's so strange that you know a lot of people use that that word sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really a sacrifice because what was mine was theirs, mm -hmm. and I had to use it for them. You know, a lot of people say there was sacrifices. That's how we live. We did football, mm -hmm. basketball, and you know we used to have the kids selling donuts and stuff. So mm -hmm. when I got to the point, you think about it. I had to when Chris when CJ was twelve, we had to go to Salt Lake City. Okay, two years later. Chris and AU, we had to go to Salt Lake City. So every year was two trips in basketball, and then sometimes it was two trips in football. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really a sacrifice. I mean, that was my 401k. I was saving it for a reason. But I, I wasn't saving it to say, I got to use this money because I'm going to get it back when he go in the NBA. Man, I ain't see that. I ain't have the vision to see that far. Right. All I know is it was something me and my wife needed and my children needed, and I didn't have nobody to ask for it. So I had to use it. You, you know, Mr. Crowder, I was reading about um, when y'all were in Miami and uh, Udonis Haslam was talking about the influence that you had on Jay. And he's calling you the OG. And he's like, you could tell that he had some, you know, he was raised right. And he was just gushing about you. What, 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 did you, did you read that? Uh, you know, talking about what, what was it about the relationship that, that struck him that way? Because I really heard you don't just talk about anyone that way and that glowing, you know what I mean, outside of the, the basketball family. You know, well, you might say that a, a young person has, is promising this, but he, I, the whole article is all talking about you. <laughs> well, within that article, what you, what you didn't mention, what UD said was, uh -huh. I wouldn't be in this league if it wasn't for Corey Crowder. I played with UD in France with his first year out. <laughs> and, I, and, and I'm the old head, so my job, was to help this young kid that's coming up behind me. Mm. And so I didn't do it for money. I did it because that was my brother. I, need, I God put him in my life for a reason. My, my job and role was to get this kid prepared for a basketball career, not NBA or whatever else. He got the love for it. He just didn't know how to be a professional. He lost his weight. Mm. And Udonis was, was unique. He would play on the scout team against us. He would beat us by himself. When I saw that, I said, UD, there's no reason you should be here. You need to be back over there. And when you get over there, you learn how to stay. And so um, the things that UD saw, 
and the way you see Jay play is exactly the same way I played. I told Jay as he started out, if you can be that a-hole and guard all those tough guys that nobody else want to do it, right. and you have a, a joy doing it, every team needs that guy. Amen. That's now, right. Now, now that, that I, I, I'm, I'm talking, but let me preach a little bit. Uh I'm not saying Boston don't have toughness, but they could have used a Jay Crowder. Miami got to the finals last year. Jay Crowder's gone. Now where they at? So yeah. I'm not I'm not hopping on him, but there is a position for the type of way that he played. There's a position on every team for that guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I saw them when they played against uh, when he played against LeBron and how frustrating he, you know, he got under LeBron's skin and how he was pushing him and everything like that. Even even to the dancing. I thought the dancing part was a little funny. I didn't think they needed to get him a check for that. <laughs> I laughed at that, to be honest with you. But but it, it goes to what you're saying. I'm going to take on the, the, the best player. Like, I'm going to guard him. I'm going to be a pest to him. I'm going to try to get him out of his game. And, you know, they were crediting you with that. And and sometimes that's a role that's a little bit difficult for players to want to take. You know, players usually want to they want to score all the points. They want to do all the, you know, but that that's a different role. Did he did he always accept that role that, you know, that that would be something that pushed him over to you or you know, how did how did that come about? I mean, when we started out on that process and I gave him that speech, I just told you when I called him into my office, asking him what he want to do. He want to play basketball, want to make money. And I had to give him the blueprint of the type of player that he could be. Offense will come. If you, if you're in the gym long enough, offense will come. Right. Defense, defense is all effort. You, right. you got to play defense on the outside of maximum three seconds. Mm -hmm. After that, somebody else is going to come help. Mm -hmm. So right. I, I tried to instill that in him early to say, this, if you can make yourself this type of player, then this – that's it. And also, he played the right way. You know, he don't try to hurt nobody or nothing like that. He just bring that toughness. And that's what Chris love about him. I mean, no matter what team he's played for, he's done the same thing. Right. And he can score – Whenever he get ready to score, and it's just the thing to have the people around that know what he brings to the team. That's why I love it when, when Chris get in trouble, whatever. He know where he at. You know that that's that's what makes a team special when you got different players doing different things. Right. And we got that type of team this year, and I love it. I man, I love it. Hey, I have to tell you, uh, when we when Miami didn't step up to the plate and give him what he was looking for. And when Booker and, and Chris called him and they told him, Jay, you're that missing piece we need. And lo and behold, those two guys saw it before we did. You know, <laughs> they knew we got Book, Book's going to do what he do. Uh, you know, Chris is going to lead us. And, and when we get down in that stretch, he's going to take control of the game. We need that guy that can that can guard all those other guys. But Jay has, has came on to where he's added some offense to his game. And so, you know, you put those three guys together. Chris's leadership, Devin Booker's got that star power. Jay Crowder's got that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out and knock your head off power. That's a fantastic team, man. Yeah, it definitely is. They're definitely fun to watch. Um, you know, it, it, it's amazing when you're when you're watching them. And just, um, I guess, a few games before, there was some devastating news that happened where it kind of shocked everyone. And that was that, you know, Chris Paul had tested positive for COVID. What yeah. was going through your mind when you when you heard that and when you heard the news? What was walk me through that process? Man, it was just wondering how. That's the first thing, like how and where. I mean, because he's a germaphobic already. And man, it was, it was a total shock. It was a shock. You know, we just got through it. He had one of his best games. And then, you know, I walked off the floor and he hugged me and his mama. And then next thing you know, he tested positive for COVID and, and nobody else had it. So, like you say, it was a shock. I mean, all we could do was pray and ask God in his time, you know, to take it away from him. That's, that's the only thing we could do. Right, right. And, and you know, he came back and, you know, he played. And it's, it's such a blessing. COVID is something where we're all still learning about it because yeah. different people react so differently when they test positive. Right. Um, but, you know, thank God he was able to come back and come back playing. I don't know. I don't remember how long the days were about how he had to sit out and, and he looks just fine. That's really a that's really a blessing. Oh, it definitely is. But like I say, it was what, almost 10, 12 days since the last time he played. Right, right, right. Let me ask y'all this. Do y'all, do you all, I, I, you know, I'm in the AAU world now 
and you know, so we've seen our, our share of of guys, you know, fathers coaching from the stands, right? And so I have my well, my son. Sometimes it's hard not to do, you know. Sometimes you want to tell him while he's on the court. Do y'all do that even even now, or do y'all kind of just sit back and just cheer? Like what what role do y'all usually have during the games? You want to take a charge? Go first. You go first, Corey. <laughs> I, uh, you know, my little routine with Jay is we have to make eye contact and give each other one of these right here so he know that I'm there. Okay. Uh, you know, the other thing that I do, I mean, the, 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 the gym is so loud. I'm one of those fathers. I'm screaming. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, I played professionally 14 years. I never got nervous when I played. <laughs> but when before their games, man, I'm a nervous wreck. I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> right. I'm a nervous wreck. I'm screaming. I'm up. I, I I don't go overboard where I want to bring any type of negativity to him or to the family or to the team. I understand right. that part. But I'm gonna cheer each and every one of those guys. Not only just for Jay. Now that he's on the team, that's family. Now I gotta support mm -hmm. those guys. So that's the way I do it. I'm the I'm the same way with, with Corey. I'm cheering for everybody. You know, going to these AU games, you know, the the other the lower level AU game, you see parents only stand up when they child. I, I can't I can't get that in my head. Why, right. why you just turn for your child? Right. I've always, when I was coaching, it's all about the team. It's mm -hmm. always about the team. And that's why I love them. Like Corey say, man, I'm cheering up. If campaign do something, that's just like my child. Right. He's part yeah. of he's part of the team. And I've never been that selfish where I just cheer for my child because all of them are important. That's why the team is so important. I mean, Monty doing a great job coaching. I know Willie Green and the rest of the coaches. All that's got to come together to be where they at today. It can't be about no one player. Right. You know, G-O-A-T on this team. Right, right, right. So, so do you still, you know, talk to Chris about the particulars of the game? And do you still talk to Jay about the particulars? Like, does that stop? I mean, because my, my son is young now. You know what I mean? And and he will have great conversations. After, and I let him come to me. I don't automatically go to him as soon as the game is over and like this, this, this. I let him come to me. And sometimes it, it might take a little bit. And, you know, then we're, we're at home. We're eating. And then he starts talking. And I'm like, all right, well, we can talk now. You know what I mean? Does, does that ever end? Do you still do that now? I mean, for me, uh, only, only when I know it's relevant. For instance, I saw him have those, those bad shooting games against the Lakers. I can see what he's doing wrong. But I can't just go up to him and say, hey, you're not jumping forward or you're not shooting in an arc. But I, I have it here just in case he opens that little door for me to say, you know, if you put a little bit more air on that jumper or if you jump forward or I see that you're jumping back or I'll say if he's really having a rough time, I'll say, hey, just go back to the basics. Set the ball, set your feet, jump forward, breathe out. So I get in and get out. You know, I couldn't have said I couldn't have said it no better. Get in and get out. If they ask you something, you, you give them your opinion. If they don't, you just tell them to keep on playing ball. Look, they had a tough game that game. Let's move on to the next game because they professionals now. Right. Oh, yeah. But uh, on the other hand, his brother sitting right down. CJ's brother, I mean, Chris' brother sitting right down the floor. So if you see him huffing at somebody, it's him because he's telling them, like, oh, quit turning the ball over, something like that. That's who he's talking to. Now, they get on it right there at the game. But me, yeah. I'm like I'm like Corey. The door have to open. Hey, I have to tell you something. Before mm -hmm. every game, uh, I send them a text. Good luck. Play hard. I love you. So in Dallas, his first year, he looked at me. He said, um, are you going to text me that every game? I said, let me explain something to you. It takes five minutes out of my day to let you know that I'm thinking about you. Amen. Versus if I have to go down to City Hall, pick up that set, that little phone between that plexiglass because you're in jail and I got to talk to you like that. I said, if it takes five minutes out of my day to keep you in that environment, instead of in that other environment, yeah. absolutely. All 82 games. I've been yeah. doing it since he was in college. Amen. That's great. I mean, that's that's I mean, that's so powerful in that relationship, that, yes. that father son relationship. And that's yes. the part where, you know, when, and when I asked you the question in the beginning, it wasn't just to bash the NBA. It was just more because I know people need to see that people need to hear the stories that you were just telling and the relationships that you have with your sons and that it doesn't ever end. You know, from the time when they're little playing Pee Wee, little, you know, to the time when they're, um, you know, MVP candidates and, you know, winning in the, in the playoffs, there's still, it's still important to have that bond. 
Um, you know, do, do you ever feel, you know, because a, a lot of times, especially now with social media, you get everybody giving their opinions about everything and then you get criticisms. Do you ever feel the need to just, you know, get back to that protective, like, stay off my baby, you know what I mean, type of a thing? Do you ever feel that need to go or, or do you even look at social media? I don't look at social media. I'm not on that. I'm not, I'm not on Facebook or none of that stuff. But I, I hear the rhetoric and, uh, yeah. you know, you just have to take it because I know, I know everybody don't like Chris Paul for various reasons. You know, it's, it's some haters out there. Some, you know, just because of weight, just because he played at Wake and they don't like the, you know, uh, jealousy and envy and strife go a long way. Right. I mean, you hear from that after Michael Jordan been playing over 30 years ago and you hear some stuff that you didn't never think the people that played with him. Right. I mean, why? Why is it so relevant now? If it wasn't right. relevant then you was playing with him. So Chris gonna have some of the same stuff. So, you know, I just look at it as, you know, as long as Chris tough enough to take it, I'm tough enough to take it too. Cause I know what I raised and I know that Chris is uh, more than a basketball player. I mean, I don't, I don't buy into. I use social media, uh, Aton. I think you already know. I'm kind of voiceless out there. Yeah. If somebody says something negative towards him, unless they're threatening to harm him, I, I don't even, I don't even get that no attention. If it's something right. that crosses the line, okay, now I got to step in and I got to protect him. Uh, most of the time, uh, you know, he'll. If if he's not struggling with it, I'm not struggling. If he come to me and it's a problem, then we got a problem. Man. But there are times when fans go too far. I think I even sent you um, the article that I read one time and I asked how, how he was doing when he was getting threats. I don't even remember what it was about, but fans go too far sometimes. You know, I, I love when fans are, you know, passionate about their team and, you know, they want to cheer for their team and stuff like that. But then you got the fans that, that really, you know, emphasize the word fanatic, like they, they go too far. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, Jay had situations where he had threats. And how do you even how do you even deal with something like that? Well, first thing, NBA's got their security. Phoenix got their security. And you got to let those two play out. You can't you can't jump the line. There's got to be a process and all that. If, if they don't handle it from there now, that's when I can get involved or the agent or whatever. So. Right. I mean, you, you got to let those guys protect their asset because that's what he is to them. He's, he's an asset, okay? Mm -hmm. And at that point, if they don't take care of the problem, then I can step in. I asked him about that, what you just spoke about. Okay. He said he was good. If he tell me he's good, then we good. If he say, Pops, I need to get this person up off of me. And, then, and we got this little thing if he asked me to do something. If I say I'm on it, it gets done. It gets so done. if he ever hears that from me, I'm on it. <laughs> it gets done. So if he comes to me and say, Pops, I need you to take care of this, and I say I'm on it, then he's going to activate me like I'm Jason Bourne, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, yeah, I, it's I, so crazy. You go to different arenas and stuff. Like, I done been in arenas where, you know, I ain't wearing no whatever team Chris is on, uh, uh -huh. uh, memorabilia or whatever, and I done had my brothers. I got, I got three brothers, and we was at a game, and my – my brother that's three years younger than me. Oh, he jumped up. I had to grab him because he couldn't take what the guy was saying. He was saying all kind of stuff. Chris Paul was this and Chris Paul. And I had to tell my brother, look, I go through this all the time. He said, but he ain't got no business saying that kind of stuff. I'm like, let it go. He and he always been a little hothead. He'll jump on somebody and grab him in a minute. Yeah. I had to grab him. But I mean, it's crazy. I I got my own teams that I like. And everybody don't like them. But at the same time, man, I'm like, I'm 60 years old. I ain't never been crazy about that the fight or hurt nobody about the team that I like or right. you know I, or my son represents. I ain't never been that crazy. You got to get a life. Yeah, I mean, I, I do wish it, it goes back to you know a, after there's starting to be fans back in the arenas. You saw for a little while it was like game after game after game. Some fan was doing something, spitting on one player, yelling at another player, throwing something at another player. It was like like. And at some point, you know, players become being viewed as less than human. Yeah. And me and my son talked about this because he was like, why would he spit on him? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, why would you even think to do something like mm -hmm. that? And I was asking, I was like, I have I have no idea why. But right. there but there is a certain point where 
fans have to realize that players are human and they can't think of players as less than human. Like they're not robots. They're not like, you know what I mean? The, you know, these beings that are like their video game characters or anything like that. Right. There's actually a human being underneath that, you know, jersey. And that's, I think, it's, it's missing sometimes. Even if you're rooting against players that you're rooting against. Right. Or teams you're rooting against. They're still human beings. Yeah. yeah. And you still got to respect the other team. Right. They just, yeah. they just like your child. Right. You wouldn't want to see no nobody get hurt on the other team. So why would you want somebody to get hurt on our team? Right. I mean, it goes both ways. You don't want to see nobody get injured or hurt or dirty play or nothing like that. So it's got to go both ways. Right. It's That's just a team. It's temporary. Have like have say, you could be on another team next year. The same yeah. team that they hate you now, right. now they love you. Right. <laughs> I mean, you're going to have knuckleheads out there and the, the NBA and the teams and the security, they just got to do their job. Mm -hmm. As fathers, we have to stay, stay clear of that stuff because we don't want to get barred from an arena because we were trying to protect our child. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to be in a situation where because the guy said something, I end up hurting him or he hurts me. Mm -hmm. You know, so you so that's a very tight line to where I have to just I have to take a step back and let those guys do their job. Yeah, but you shouldn't be put in that position to have to make that decision. You know what I mean? I, I think the NBA can do a, a even better job than they're doing. And they have made different strides to, to try to, you know, um, you know, come down and point out fans that are unruly and things like that. I think they just need to keep on improving in that area because you shouldn't be put in that position. And you shouldn't be put in that position where you have to make a decision that you feel you have to defend your your son or somebody else or your wife who's there with you or something like that you you shouldn't be in that position that's just that's just my personal opinion you know but it was somebody it was somebody's family in Utah they were attacking yeah. wasn't it yeah I saw that it was T it was T Morant John Morant yeah that's John Morant John yeah. Morant yeah yeah that's that's, that, that's that's uncalled for that that should let never me happen. hey let me ask let me ask you this question uh -huh. is it a racial thing. Because look at the people that were targeted. In some cases, it is. In yeah. some cases, it definitely is. Some I mean, cases, it is. And some of them, just crazy fans. Just crazy yeah. fans. I think it goes both ways. Both now, ways. You, in Utah, there's there's not that many of us. So so there's there's always going to be a racial element, you know, because you look at the stands, and it's really like the only black people are the people who are from the team. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really, there ain't no other black people in the stands. But, you know, it, it sometimes it, it definitely is a racial element. But then I think back to the amount of of discipline and the amount of restraint that people like Bill Russell and Kareem and all those guys had to use for years. And they'll tell you right now, we shouldn't have been in that position to have to use that restraint. And, but we still had to. And that's the part where it's an unfair position to be all this. And that's why I said the NBA has to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do, because they're, they're, they're gonna pick the wrong person. The fans are gonna pick the wrong person to do that to, and you're gonna yep. have a bad situation. And, we're gonna have so, another. We're gonna have another Ron Artest. Yeah, I mean, and none of that would have happened if the fan wouldn't have hit him in the face with with the cup. It wouldn't have happened. Right. None of everything else that happened after that would have would have occurred if that fan wouldn't have threw that cup and hit him in the head. That's just right. that's well, the main it. thing. The main thing that people got to realize, black and white, that. These players are not significant just because they're basketball players. They're significant because they're people. Uh -huh. And that's the thing that you have to get by. They like, oh, the only reason you're protecting them is because they're making all this money in, you know, in the NBA. Well, no, nah, we want it to work for all people. Right. Me and Corey, me and Corey too. Right. Y'all don't know who we are. We want it to work for us, too. Right. Right, right, right. So um, I'm going to ask you this last question. I'll let y'all go. What is the, the, the proudest moment? That you that you've had with with your son so far was the, was the absolute proudest moment. I'm gonna give you a second to think about it because that's a, it's a tough question to ask. I know it's it's a tough one. You know what I mean? That's not like a regular question. You know, but the the proudest moment, the moment where you're just beaming with pride, almost to the point of you know your allergies start acting up. You gotta get a couple of a strong <laughs> blinks in there. You know what I mean? Because you man, just, it's so, been so many. Right, right. I know. You, it's yeah, been so many. Uh, we'll try to give you, try to give me one or two. Try to give you a few proudest moments. I have to tell you, if I had to pick one, the his second junior college he went to, the coach allowed me 
to write those guys a motivational letter before the game. Mm. And I did some research, so I had a little information on all of the players that I incorporated into that speech. He read that to them before that game, and they went out and won a national championship. So I feel like I was a part of that too. So that probably had to be uh, that and him winning the national player of the year. And, I, and the reason I picked that because, um, and I haven't told Mr. Paul this, but on a micro level, I was a national player of the year, all American. The same and, uh, as cool. it's the same as your champion. son. I know that. And Jay uh-huh. was a national champion, all American, and national player of the year. So for him to uh, accomplish that feat, that also matched what I did, that that brought me great joy. That's great. That's great. That's great. Uh, one of the one of the ones, like you said, that really gave me the one of the ones was when he scored the 61 points for my father-in-law. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was a coach on that team. And uh, the head coach asked me, you know, I'm just into the into the game, watching what all the boys got to watch what all the boys know. And he came over and asked me how many more points he need. And I'm like, what you talking about? And he said, well, you're trying to score. And, I'm, and then the coach looked at me and said, don't, you don't get it. Because I wasn't in, in, in that realm of knowing that he was trying to score 61 points in, in uh, remembrance of my father-in-law that you know was uh, murdered by five teenagers. Mm. And he was 61 years old. And um, when he came, uh, when, he went, when he got fouled and went to the foul line and threw it out and came and fell in my arms, uh, we both just hugged and cried, you know. Wow. We just hugged and cried, you know, and it was all about somebody that he loved. Wow. And, you know, I've oh, never man. wavered about how much my son loved me, both of them. So, you know, it's my son don't have to buy me a thing or do nothing for me. He just, I mean, cards, and he tell me, we, we always told each other we love each other to this day. We love, you know, we love each other. Un- regardless of whatever, we love each other. And that's the real thing about fatherhood is tell your boys you love them. Right. Every day. Every, Every day. day. That's right. That's right. Wow. Wow, that was an amazing story right there. Um, you know, I remember seeing the footage of it, but, you know, hearing you explain it, yeah, yeah, that's that's powerful. Well, I listen, I, I have much respect to both of y'all. Well, much, thank you. Much respect to your sons. Um, you know, and I, I'm glad that you all have you know, express the way that you have expressed, um, you know, the love for your sons, the importance of you being there for your sons. And it's inspirational for other fathers watching this. And that's, you know, the reason why this, this, we need to promote this more. And, um, oh, I do have one more question for you. I want to ask you about the the network that you have, because I want you to promote it and and what you're doing with other fathers, other NBA fathers, and um, how you are connecting with each other and doing things around, around the, you know what I mean, around the country. So tell me a little bit about the uh, program that you do. Well, it's called Fathers and Men of Professional Basketball Players. And, and we recruit dads that's in the, in the NBA and uh, we've been doing it for 10 years. And we just try to give them a reality of, you know, especially the new dads like Jay Morant and all them. We want to tell them stuff that they won't have to go through mm. when they get in the league. You know, because we got information that you ain't going to get nowhere else except from a father of an NBA player. Mm-hmm. Some of the stuff that we experience and some of the other dads experience, you only going to get that from somebody that's been there and knowing mm-hmm. and to keep you from going through some of the other stuff that's out there, you know, against you. And that's the, that's what we're about. And, uh, man, it's it's been a blessing. Like, I want Corey to join, but guess what? I want Corey to do what he's doing right now. Because I already know he's a true father. So he's then been in the league long enough where he could be give great advice to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And that's all it is. It's a network of fathers trying to reach these other fathers. So some of the stuff that we could tell them that you ain't got to go through that or give them advice and point them in a the direction where they need to go to get help. Because this NBA life ain't easy, you know, especially mm-hmm. to the dads when it come to we talking about that re- reverse role playing. Uh-huh. Now all of a sudden, all the stuff you used to do for your kids, now your son can do that and even more. Uh-huh. That role reverse, and it affects a lot of men in different ways uh-huh. that you never think about. Uh-huh. And you need to be ready for it because if your kids start thinking like that, 
you need to take a back seat. I'm making the money. I'm making the oh no, brother, you in trouble, man. <laughs> You're right, right. You know, I'm fighting for my manhood because that's right. like, I've been all my life. Right. You can take any. You can take the money, the cars, the houses. Can't take this manhood. Right. Can't take this fatherhood. Right. So that's right. what we try to do with fathers and men: educate. That's great. And y'all have a website. You know, one, note, one note on that. Mm -hmm. We meet a lot of fathers, but they have to be willing to accept the information. Mm -hmm. You got some fathers; they know everything. <laughs> I, I, I met a father. I met a father that played professionally. His son wanted to go play, but he took the love away, a love of basketball away from the kid. Mm. The kid could be making in the NBA five to ten million dollars. He's at home. He's one of those robocall guys that will call your phone. And that's what he's doing. He's 6'11. Mm. Mm. But his father took the love of basketball away from him. So now he don't love it. He don't want to play anymore. So you got. And I would. I would tell the guy, let me talk basketball to your son. You love him. No, That's no, no. Right. I, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Me and my son would have a great relationship, and he ruined it for the kid. You know what the father's doing now every day? He sit at home drinking all day every day. Yeah, you know, he's telling the truth. He he is telling the truth. He so tells. somebody's got to be willing to accept the information from people who's already went through the struggles, so they can tell you this will happen if you're not careful. There there are women out there that knows that these guys schedule better than they do. Yeah, yeah. you know, and then you got these hanger ons. These guys, man, if they can if they can latch on to a guy, oh, I'm down with Chris, or I'm down with with Jay. Then now they 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 sitting there wrote their ticket on, on our kids back, you know. So you yeah. have to be careful. You know, it's amazing that you say that because you know now I'm in I'm in the um, AAU world and I see, you know, over anxious, overzealous fathers take the love of the game yes. away from their kids. Yes, but I see it a lot. Not, not oh, I just yeah. see like one yeah. or two or oh. three. I see it a lot where the kid don't even want to play basketball no more. Mm -hmm. That's the truth right there. Now that is the truth. Man, yep. that's that's tough, but that's and why the we reason need the reason that is, and I tried to tell that guy that is a kid cannot decipher when you're getting on him about basketball. Are you angry about basketball, or are you angry at him because you're my father? Yeah. So they can't <laughs> decipher the two. It's tough, you know. So I, I tell any parent the only thing you should say to your kid mm -hmm. is good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, and play hard after the game. Say good job, son. You didn't win, yeah, but you know, keep working. That's right. it. Right. That's but right. if you tell that kid, "Oh, you're never going to amount to nothing. You blew the game. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that?" He right. don't want to hear that from you. Right, <laughs> right. Corey right. been in my. He been in my. He been in my head. He been in my office. <laughs> Same stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 tough. You know, sometimes fathers they they're living vicariously through their sons. And, you know, the, and they're 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 trying to put on, you know, what they want their sons to be able to do to be perfect, which you cannot be perfect and play basketball. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. You can always Ooh. say something negative about somebody any game. But if you harp on that by itself, Man. Then you could easily take the joy because you don't hear none, no positivity. Man. But if you listen to what me and Mr. Paul was just saying this whole conversation, uh -huh. we're here to support our kids. This is not about us. Those parents, it's about them because yes, they want to be able to say, look at me. Look at what yeah. we got. Yeah, no, no, we yeah. ain't got nothing. He's out there breaking his back. And right. Whatever he wants to give you, we got. Right. But right. we yeah. ain't got nothing. That's right. 100% right. true. Oh, that's great. Well, I, you know, I want y'all to do more. Oh, uh, the website. Tell me about the website that you have uh, for the network. F-A-M-P-B-P, -P, Fathers and Men's of Professional Basketball Players .com. Great. Great, great. Well, keep doing what you're doing. Um, we're everybody's enjoying the playoffs, so keep good luck to your sons and, and everything like that. And uh, keep doing what you're doing. Much respect to you, and thanks for coming on the new match today. Thank hey, you. I want to tell you. I want to tell you. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank uh, you, you know, Mr. Paul ain't, ain't, ain't really got to know you yet, but I, I I watch you. You know, there's a couple of times I seen your message, and I think you were saying, "Who is this cat?" And then once you you saw in there, you was like, Mr. Crowder, okay, okay, yeah. I, I see what you what you're talking about. So mm -hmm. I want to take my hat off to you, sir, and keep doing what you're doing, please. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, yes, I, I've, been, I've been blessed. So you know, definitely Thank when you're you. blessed, you have a platform. You can say things that maybe other people can't really say, 
or you know and try to help people and use your platform to help especially young people that's 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 what it's all about that's so what it's all about forward. 